Good to see you this morning. And we had a uh, good time away this past week. God taught me a very valuable lesson. I found out that it isn't that I don't like flying. I found out that God's telling me you got to just give up control. You're not in control of things. You think you are, but you're not in control of things. So we actually had a beautiful flight. So thank you for your prayers. And if you didn't pray for me, ha, I made it. <laughs> but it was, it was really good. And so we're, we're glad. Hey, um, a couple of things. Um, next, or this Friday coming up is we're going to have a, uh, a night of celebration. And uh, so Jim has completed a, a CD. And so he's gonna, we're going to be doing a night of music and worship um, at 7 o'clock, uh, probably 7 to 9, no later than 9. And so we're just going to have a, um, Jim, some of his musical friends and myself and others, we're going to be here. And so we're going to be playing the songs on that CD. So if you're able to come Friday night, please come Friday night. And Jim's going to be giving out for free um, his CDs. So you can listen to them. You can use them as coasters, whatever you choose to do. But um, Frisbees, yeah, you know, and uh, you can sail them across the yard. But, but we are going to be here um, on the Friday night from 7 to, uh, from 7 to 9. And uh, a reminder that our live nativity is really right around the corner, November 23rd. So um, we've got our Word of Life students there all set. I'm looking for three magi. You remember the guys, right? Frankincense and myrrh and gold. So, um, so we need uh, three magi. If anybody would like to volunteer to be a magi, that would be marvelous. Um, there's a couple of speaking parts. I have the script for that. It's not a big deal. And, um, and a King Herod. Um, if I were king of the forest. So if you want to be a King Herod and not from the Wizard of Oz, you can do that. But a King Herod as well. So um, those are some things to ponder. And um, there are in the back... There's a little wooden uh, box out on the table, and there are cards out there to, for you to take, to hand out to people, to invite them to come. So please, take those cards, hand them out, and invite people to come November 23rd. It's a Saturday, and it's going to be inside. So it's going to be downstairs, and uh, so uh, the men have been working very, very hard and diligently um, on that, and that is, that's awesome. The other thing, too, is, is that um, our Family Ministry Center is coming together, and so this um, last weekend, uh, met with, with um, Anita, Ethan was down there. So we've got some plans for that, and we're going to be starting to get the furnishings in there and um, the gaming table, and so, so an area for Bible study, another area for recreation. So that's coming in. We'd like to have that completed so that um, people will um, be able to see uh, what we have available for, for their families here at First Baptist Church. Um, other than that, I can't think of anything else. If there's something, oh yeah, just looking right at her. How could I forget? Uh, I'm just going. You put a cutoff time with a seven, so I'm, you know it's unforgivable. But anyway, next Saturday, it's the second Saturday of every month. The ladies' ministry meets, and we're meeting here, and that is at 11 a.m. So 11 a.m. Ladies, um, see Holly if you'd like to join with her uh, women's ministry, and so. It's the second Saturday of every month at 11 a.m., and it's coming up this Saturday. So that would be uh, November the uh, 9th, I believe. Yeah, so November 9th at 11 a.m. All right. Jim, would you please open us up in prayer, and welcome back. Thanks. Yeah. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4 say, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Lord, we, we trust in you today. We, uh, we want to have our minds, our attentions, our emotions stayed on you, focused on you, Lord. And so um, we know you're here. And, uh, Lord, we, uh, we have needs. We have praises. We have a life. And you're involved in every last aspect of it, Lord. So this morning in this service, uh, where two or three are gathered, and we are two or three gathered in your name, we, uh, we thank you for your presence here, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. This is a song I've done once here, so you may not remember it, so we'll run through it a couple of times. Oh Lord, I desire to walk before you with a pure Desire. It is 
Rescue me from my 
come for a time of prayer and um, if you come on Wednesday night um, you, you probably know that and this has been on my heart for years and years and years 
but it's to get away from needs-based praying and get into scripture-based praying. That is biblical. Our needs, actually, is the very last thing that we're to pray about. We are to first prepare. And how do you prepare? You cannot go to prayer without the word of God. And you should not go to prayer, certainly, without the word of God, the Bible, and without your notebook and without a pen. And I would even bring along a devotional. Maybe it's um, Daily Bread. Maybe it's Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. But that is how we begin in prayer. We must prepare. And once you prepare and you come through the word of God, face to face with the living God through his word, then it is adoration. Then you begin to adore him. You begin to worship him and you, you praise him through his word. Which leads us into confession. We begin to see who we are in view of who he is. We begin to pour out confession our sins and, and ask the question, what sin do I need to confess before you today, O oh God? And so we prepare to adore him as we confess. And then we go with thanksgiving. There we are in our thanksgiving before him. And as we're thanking him for all of who he is and for what he's done and thanking him for the cross, thanking him, the son of God, for what he's done for us. And then we get into consecration. Mm, you don't think about that in consecration, do you? That, Lord, consecrate our lives. Let my life, why, be consecrated unto you. And then it is supplication. Supplications, if I were to ask you, what is a supplication? Would any of you know what supplications actually are? You're to pray for yourself. How could you ever pray for other people if you're not prepared spiritually and physically? Right? Be like running a race and, and, or somebody, you're going to run a race. And let's say Ethan's going to go out and he's going to run a race. But he says, oh, I can't make it that day. And I'll go, no problem, Ethan. I'll run that race for you. Great. It's a, it's a 5K. No problem. You can do that. Yes. Have you ever run before? No. Have you ever at least walked? No. How can we ever go in to prepare or pray without even being prepared? So it's our supplications. Pray for yourself. The word of God shows us that in the Psalms. David prayed for himself over and over again. Throughout the Bible we see men and women praying for themselves to be prepared spiritually and physically. And then the last is intercessory prayer. The very last one in biblical praying is intercessory prayer. But the very first thing we do is we hit the request, don't we? without ever seeking the Lord's face to prepare, to adore him, to confess, to say thank you, to make sure that our lives are consecrated before him, to bring our own supplications, and then finally intercessory prayer. So Wednesday nights we're moving into that, and that which I just gave you in a thumbnail sketch, I'll have a handout for everybody. And you to take home, and next week I'll have them on the table. If you can't make it Wednesday night, then I want you to take that with you and to start really t learning how to pray biblically. As Don Whitney said in his book, the reason why most people don't have a, they don't have a consistent prayer life is because we say the same old things the same old way. And after a while, we even get bored with ourselves. But we never get bored with the Scriptures. We never get bored with adoring him. We never get bored with acknowledging that we're sinners and, and showing, wow, wow, Lord, look what you've done for me. And to have, Lord, consecrate my life so I could live my life for you. And to go in our supplications as he prepares us to intercede on behalf of others. So I'll have that for you Wednesday and I'll have that for you on, um, just for a handout if you can't. And we're going to look toward maybe even doing another time of, of prayer as well. It's, prayer is so important. Without prayer... The church is dead. You have to pray. There's no ministry of the word without prayer. Everything lives and breathes on prayer. But we have to make sure that we pray according to how the Lord taught us to pray. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we praise you today that we can call you Father. 
And the only way that is possible, that we can actually have a relationship with you, is through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. So, Father, as Jim even quoted from Isaiah, Lord, if we would fix our mind on you, you will keep us in that perfect peace that passes all understanding. But we have to trust in you. And how can we trust in you without knowing you? And so, Father, we come, pray that we will spend time at your feet as Mary did, who chose the good thing. We may be troubled by many things as Martha was, but Father, when we are in your presence, our mind is fixed on you and you keep us in perfect peace when we trust you. And Lord, we know that you're coming again. And so we do pray in the holy name of Jesus that your kingdom would come Lord, let your will be done on earth. We are praying, Lord, for that time. Yes, for the return of Christ. But in the meantime, we pray that, Lord, salvation would come to the lost. That they find themselves not in the kingdom of the abyss of darkness and eternal separation from you, O God. But they find themselves in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. Because they've come to know the grace of Jesus Christ through faith. We thank you, Father, for what you give us each and every day. Thank you for the provisions. I pray we will count our blessings and name them, each one of them, one by one as we sing. The Lord, the tempter is at work today. And we know that you do not lead us into temptation. But in fact, while we are being tempted, you provide a way of escape. I pray, Father, as we spend time with you, we will be able to see with spiritual eyes that way of escape from the tempter's plan. And forgive us, Lord. We confess our sins. You are faithful and just. Will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, only possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we come, Lord, and the forgiveness offered to us so freely given on the cross. And how I pray, Lord, with that same forgiveness that's been given to us, we would forgive others. We would lay no charge against them. Even as Jesus said and as, as Stephen said, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Lord, we are at times working in ignorance. Just as Paul said, Lord, many of these, they're all blinded by the prince of this age. The gospel has been hid from their eyes. But Lord, you can open it. So we pray, Father. That as we live our lives as you lived, conduct our lives like Christ, Lord, you would lead us to forgive others. Even you said, it's easy to love those who love us, but you say love your enemies. What a challenge, Lord. And protect us from the evil one, O oh God. That we would not fall into the the snare that so easily besets us. For yours is the kingdom and the glory. Not for a period of time, but for always. Amen. And Lord, today we, we come to you and there are people who are hurting in our church. And Lord, this morning I was reminded of Bev. And Bev is not feeling well. And, and Lord, Chrissy has been up until 3 o'clock this morning with her mom. She can't sleep. And Lord, um, we pray for Bev today. Lord, the retention of fluid and, and Lord, just the pain that she seems to be suffering again. Her sleep is disturbed. And, but we also pray for Chrissy, Lord, as she ministers to her mother. We pray for others who are being afflicted in ways that we cannot imagine. This morning, Lord, I lift up to you the, the trooper who was struck on Interstate 87 and his family, Lord, we don't know his condition other than it was critical. But Lord, we lift him up to you today and the tow truck operator. Father, we thank you for our military and, and for all those who protect this land. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to, to cast a vote this week. 
And I pray we not vote with our conscience, but I pray we examine, Lord, the candidate by your word. While no one perfect will ever occupy the office of the presidency, we must look to the scriptures, Lord. We must look to the scriptures. And today we are learning that Christians are not going to vote. How sad is that? Lord, we must vote. It's been paid for at a price with human blood. And Lord, you have set your grace upon this nation with your divine blood. You have set us apart. So Lord, I pray that we will vote, but we will search the scriptures, Lord, as we go into that voting booth. And Lord, we thank you that regardless of the outcome, our prince is not in the White House. But we trust in you with all of our hearts. You set up rulers and you take them down, all according to your plan. Nations you rise up and nations you take down, all according to your plan. And while some will trust in chariots and horses, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Today, Father, I pray that we will exalt the name of Jesus in all that we do to your glory forever and amen. Jim. I don't know if I'll be able to communicate this clearly, but um, somebody sent me a song uh, about, a, about a week ago, and it was a song that had just come out. And I listened to it, I thought, great song. And then somebody else sent me the same song. Completely unrelated people. One of them was somebody I only see about once a year. And then I went on YouTube, as I do often, looking for arrangements of music and looking for new songs and that kind of thing. And the very first song that came up was that same song. And, and the Lord was saying to me a strange thing. He, sa he said, who am I? Uh, and of course, our, our natural reaction to that is, well, you're God. You're the great I am. I'm gonna, what are you gonna, okay, what are you going to do about who I am? That was the question that really nailed me. I'm going to love you. I'm going to serve you. I'm gonna, no, no, no. What are you going to do about who I am? Well, I, I'm going to do these. No. What are you going to do about who I am? And then this song came along. And um, I'm going I'm to ask you to stand up. If, if you can, if you want to, you don't have to, but if, if you could stand for this song. This, this is a song we're going to do next week. Uh, I'm going to put it in the rotation. We're going to do it um, often enough so it gets familiar. Uh, it's three verses, three choruses, and a bridge. You'll pick it up as we go along. But it's important, and I've said this before, sometimes to take a posture in worship, to make a physical commitment to the fact, kneel, lay prostate, prostate, get that word wrong every time, Tate, wrong, uh, on the floor, uh, bow your heads, close your eyes, lift your hands, wh whatever it is. And the ultimate goal of worship is for us to be in his presence. Uh, he doesn't need our worship. We need to worship him. And he wants us to be drawn closer and closer. And he says that if we seek him with our whole heart, we'll find him. But what he's really saying is if we seek him with our whole heart, he'll find us. We don't have the capability of actually reaching out to God, but he will enable that for us. And, and, the, and the final goal is to be in his presence, whether it's in the things we do during the day or at the end of our lives or at the end when eternity begins for all of us or whatever the circumstance, he wants us to be in his presence. And how dare we, how dare we not stand in the presence of God, in the solemnity and majesty of who he is,
remain standing, if you would. Jim was right. And a number of years ago, I did this on a regular basis, and I got away from it. But we ought to stand to honor God at the reading of his word. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame, according to all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. Father, speak to us through your word. And Lord, I pray that you will give us confidence in your plan and your plan alone, regardless of the circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated and the children may go to Children's Church. The past few weeks, I've been talking about the Christian faith, that you can have faith in the Christian faith because you can verify it biblically, you can verify it historically. It is a verifiable faith. And Luke is writing this, this beautiful letter to his friend Theophilus about the Christian faith. And once he has established this for, for Theophilus, now the, the very beginning, he's beginning to show him some things. And he's leading us here into what we would know as the preparation for John the Baptist to be born. God's plan, our hope. This time of the year is awesome. There seems to be a transition. Um, all of a sudden now we, we are getting out of like the summer months and we're getting into the fall season. But now all of a sudden things start to change. Um, the scented candles are coming out. Some of them are really absolutely beautiful. And the scented candles start to bring you into a season, a season of hope, don't they? We start to see the decorations coming out. In just a few short weeks, we're going to have this place decorated, right, preparing to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. It isn't long after we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ that we enter, if the Lord so would will, that we go into a new year and we begin to look to the cross and to the resurrection. There seems to be a time in our, in our lives from around November, a time of thanksgiving into a time of the celebration of, of God in the flesh, God with us, Christmas time, to transferring into the newness of a new year and then returning to the cross and to, and to remember him who died for us and then the resurrection in the celebratory time. By the way, I think that's an awesome song to sing on Resurrection Sunday. Sunday. Uh, and so this time of season, there is this hope. And if you are plagued like I am um, with the, the Hallmark Channel, you will see hope for the holidays coming out, right? All this hope for the holidays. And everybody gets excited and we can say, hey, can you live in the plan of God? And we go, oh yeah, we're going to live in God's plan. Well, let's take away all of the scented candles, all of the trappings of whatever season we're coming into, and let's go all the way back before the cross. Let's go before the cross. And now we are no longer Gentiles. Every one of us now is a Jew. Okay, you there? You are in the Jewish culture. And, and the Bible tells us that in this time when Zechariah and Elizabeth lived, it was in the days of King Herod of Judea. Now you're back in the culture, but you have to understand some things. You've got to put this into proper perspective. When we're talking about living in God's plan and in the hope of his plan. And I'm going to give you a statement and see if you agree with it 
First, God always accomplishes his plan for his people. Do you agree with that statement? Amen. The question is this. How do you respond to God's plan in your life when it's not your plan? If you believe that God always accomplishes his plan for his people, then the question for us is, how do we respond for God's plan in our life? Now, we're before the cross, and we are living in the days of King Herod. So let's put this into proper perspective here. Verses 5 through 7 give us an introduction of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And they tell us they lived during the days of King Herod of Judea. This is Herod the Great. He ruled from 37 to 34 B.C., he was, a, he was actually placed in power by Rome. So we would say that he was nothing more than a puppet king. This is who he was. It was not a peaceful time in Israel. It's not a peaceful time right now in Israel. And quite frankly, it's not a peaceful time in the United States of America. It's not a peaceful time in the world right now. There are uprisings all around the world today. It's not a peaceful time. But in Israel back then, it was not a peaceful time. Why? Because Israel were a defeated people. And they were watching as this foreign power, Rome, was occupying their land. This is what was going on. And now they have this tyrant, this King Herod, who is over the people. Remember last time we we looked at the Christian faith, I said it's a biblical faith, but I said it's also a historical faith. And you can look back at this very king when he ruled, and secular history records him. But it not only records that he was king during this time, It also gives a record of what he was doing. You still with me? We are all Jews. We're living back in that time. And who is our king? It's Herod. He is ruling over the land. He's not really our king, but he is the secular king. And history records that he murdered many of his own family. He had ten wives and he murdered his favorite wife. Imagine that. Ten wives and murdered his favorite one. He murdered her grandfather. He murdered her brother. He murdered some of his very own children. And one occasion, history records that he had the whole Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jewish government, assassinated. Imagine waking up to that news that the ruling body of your government was just assassinated under the ruling king. Wow. On another occasion, he had every man that would be notable in Jerusalem murdered. Christ was born during the latter years of Herod's reign, and his reign as king had been a long one. This fact shows how much of a bloody tyrant he really was. Just imagine, he wouldn't even be around when the child king would come. But he heard of this child king. And he could not take it. He was possessed by evil. He was ruthless. And Matthew 2, 16 records that he had all the children killed, not only in Bethlehem, but in all the coasts thereof. 
This is society. This is the ruler of that society of which we've transferred back there. We're living there. And now we're introduced into the characters of this particular account. But we're not just being introduced into the characters, but we are given the character of the characters in this account. We've been introduced into Herod already. We see his character. But now Luke introduces us into Zechariah and Elizabeth. He says that there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth descended from Aaron, Moses' brother, the father of the priesthood in Israel. Zechariah, we see he was a, a priest of a certain one's division. Imagine, you have to think about this, a division. Back then, there were like 20,000 people. They had to have these divisions of priests that could take care of, of the people. And so he served in the temple from the time, you ready for this? His division served in the temple from the time of King David. You can see that all the way back in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. So what, a, what longevity that Zechariah has. But what a name he has. Zechariah means remembered of Jehovah. Isn't that beautiful? Elizabeth. Here's her character and her lineage. She is from the daughters of Aaron. And her name means one whose oath is to God. One whose oath is to God. What beautiful names were given to these two godly people. As for character, <coughs> verse number 6 tells us, both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame, according to all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Hmm. Both were righteous in God's sight. Not one, but both. They were joined together as husband and wife. A godly man and a godly woman who have now come together and they're committed to each other and they're committed to living for God as husband and wife. And the Bible says that they were righteous before God. Together they came before God seeking him. It wasn't that one went off on his own and she went off on her own. Together they came before God seeking him. Wow. Why would they seek him? What was their purpose in seeking him? What is our purpose in seeking the Lord? To please him. This is going to be important in just a little bit. And so they always sought the Lord to please him, to make sure that they were pleasing in his sight. Living righteous lives. The Bible says that they were conducting their lives, they were walking in his ways in all the commandments and all the ordinances of the law. In other words, because they, were, they could live their lives, their conduct of life was so righteous. How? It's because they lived their life with the word of God. They didn't guess at life. They didn't say, I wonder what Jesus would do. I wonder what God would do. Huh. Let's think about that. No. They knew him through the scriptures. They were trained up and they sought him together in the scriptures and so their thoughts were controlled by what the scriptures had to say. Their minds, the Bible says, as Jim quoted from Isaiah, and God will keep anyone whose mind is fixed on him 
and perfect peace if we trust him. That's a promise. They're conducting their lives in all the commandments and ordinances of the law. So their behavior, their tongues, their minds, they're doing everything to please the Lord in all that they did. And the Bible says that they were blameless. Wow. Does that mean that they were perfect? Absolutely not. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's no perfect person other than the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean then to be blameless? They were faithful. They lived in such a way that no matter where they went, they could get references from anybody in the town. And the references would be glowing references. No one could lay a charge against Zacharias and Elizabeth. The Bible says this is who they were. No one could say, aha, I've got them in a sin. Because their lives were the same private as they were public. Billy Graham's children testified of him. And they said, My, our dad is the same man you see preaching the word of God in stadiums and before presidents and kings and rulers of the world. He is that same man in our home. There is no difference between his public and his private life. This was Zacharias and Elizabeth together. Both of them committed to the Lord. They lived honestly before both God and men. And their conduct was displayed in public life for everyone. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 20. You'll recognize them, his disciples, by their fruit. And then Jesus asked a question, as most rabbis did. Tom was talking about asking questions last week. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit. But a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. And every time the scripture is quoted, there's always somebody that tries to rationalize that because we know somebody who has claimed to be a Christian, but their life looks nothing like a Christian. But we want to believe that they're really Christians. But the Bible says, and the word of God says, because Jesus is the word of God, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. You can recognize Zacharias and Elizabeth by their fruit. We got to stop trying to rationalize this verse. And when we see people that we know and love who have claimed to be Christians but are producing bad fruit, we ought to actually lead them to the cross where they may truly be saved and not wishing or hoping that they are. And so they're recognized by God and others by their fruit, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. And the Bible tells us that they were faithful even unto old age. Isn't that awesome? Now, what a challenge is that for me and for you, for all of us, to be faithful even unto old age where God would remember us all the way through to our very days. This is who they were. Hmm. Stark. Astonishing. Oh, to be remembered by God in this way. We always talked about what kind of legacy you're going to live. How do you want to be remembered? I'll tell you what. Memory doesn't last very long in most people. The fact is the years go on and families go on. Let me ask some of you here. How many of you remember your great-grandparents? Some of you may be mature enough to remember them. 
But how much do you actually remember of them? And then how do you remember of your great-great-grandparents? I'll tell you what, my grandparents have been gone for over 50 years. I remember some of the things of them, but I don't remember all of the things that I once remembered. Right? My, my dad's been gone for 11 years. My mom's been gone for two years. I remember a lot of the things, but I don't remember all of them. Oh, memory fades with time. Legacy fades with time. How would you want to be remembered by God? You see, his memory never fades. That is a legacy, to be remembered by God by conducting our lives the way Elizabeth and Zechariah. And this is marvelous. Everybody's getting, oh, I, I, I can't, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow God's plan. And everybody's getting ready to chest bump and a fist bump and all the other things. Remember where we are. Here comes the challenge. The situation is about to change. Everything's going great. They were righteous. But verse number seven says they were childless. Now you need to know something about what that meant back then. Because they were wondering why, they, why are they childless? You see... For a Jewish woman, and I would dare say even after, even for a Gentile woman, and for years and years and years, until the recent demonic influence over our own nation, women actually believed that it was a blessing to bear a child. Because a child is an inheritance from the Lord himself. That was a blessing. They were childless. How could they be childless? Because you have to understand something else here. Is that back then, if a Jewish woman did not bear a child, something was wrong with her and God in a relationship. But the Bible tells us that they have been living according to all the commandments of God. You see, we're reading it here. But they weren't reading it back then, were they? God knew them. But she was barren. That's a desert-like description of a womb that has no life in it. It's dried up like a desert floor. It's cracked. Now let's think about Elizabeth and Zechariah for a moment. And let's go back. It's your... Time to get married. And oh, what a celebration that must have been. A godly man and a godly woman of such a beautiful lineage coming together, who live and rightly before God. And they get married. It's not long after that some of the women who were maybe of Elizabeth's age would go up to her and say, Elizabeth, just thought I'd check. Are you and Zacharias planning on having any kids? Well, that would have been a dumb question to ask back then. Oh, yes, we are. Yes, back, we're, we're trying. We're, we're, we're planning on having kids. Oh, that's awesome. So are we, yeah. And some time would go on. Elizabeth, are you guys planning on having any kids? And the same women who are asking the question, now they've got, they're got a little bit of a pouch here, but Elizabeth's stomach is flat. And the days go on. And now those women who had a little bit of a pouch that grew into be a bigger pouch and gave birth to their own children are asking the question. But now it transitions as Elizabeth is getting a little bit older and they begin to say, Elizabeth, we're praying for you and Zechariah. No longer are you planning to have a child. We're, we're praying for you that, that God would give you a child. While Elizabeth sees all of her friends and women in the community with children that she so desires to bear for her own husband. And now the time goes on. No longer are the women asking, are you planning on having the children? No longer are the women saying, we're praying for you, Elizabeth. No. Now 
the women are. Something must be wrong with her. She can't bear a child. She can't. She's too old to bear a child. And now the whispers start to fall. This is what Elizabeth is dealing with. This is what Zechariah is dealing with. Wow. What happened to God's plan? There's no nursery to be built. None of the trappings to get us excited. It's, it's not there anymore. How could she even rejoice in the pregnancy of other women when she herself is barren? She can't have a child. And Elizabeth is, is aware of something that she would be, in the eyes of the people, called a disgrace among the people. Verse 25. The Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. You see, a Jewish woman back then who could not bear a child would be thought to be a disgrace. Now we fast forwarded it a little bit there. But they were childless there. Well along in years. And they had to adjust their lives to this reality. We're not going to have a child. We're not going to bear children. Do you know that being righteous does not free you from problems? You can be the most godly person in this gathering today. And I'd like one of you to stand up and tell me I am free from problems. I have lived a problem-free life since I became a Christian. No, Jesus, in fact, said, in this life, in this world, you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so they are, have the stigma for now with them. So it's a serious problem for Zechariah and Elizabeth. It's a big problem for them. And it weighed heavy on their hearts, I'm sure, and in their minds. Because according to that culture, they lost the favor of God. Remember what I said earlier? They sought the Lord to please him. They did everything they possibly could. But what they could not see happening right now was that God's plan was actually at work. What happens in your life, what happens in my life, in our lives, when we believe that God has this plan, but it doesn't come about? Could it be that it's really our plan and we're saying it's God's plan? Would you just be willing to surrender to God's plan regardless of the outcome? See, this is what happened to me this past week. Remember I told you I hated to fly? Some of you I did. We had a flight on to Florida. I, I'm not comfortable with flying. I declared it. I don't like flying. And I was not happy that I had to fly. So the night before I had to fly, <laughs> I didn't have any sleep at all. But it wasn't about being nervous or fear. God was leading me to seek him. And God actually brought that very verse of Isaiah up. You want perfect peace? You better keep your mind fixed on me and trust in me. And God was teaching me, you think you're in control. You have control of nothing not one thing can you control. And so that morning I got up and we we're getting ready to go. And Patty's asking me, I'm okay. I said, I have no fear. None. Got in line. The only thing I didn't like was TSA. I was mad because I had to take my shoes off. I think, Are you kidding me? I knew I should have worn my sandals. Probably had taken them off. And God was so good. That it was like just flying on a cloud. I mean, we didn't get a bump. Nothing. It was perfect. And that entire two and a half hours, I praised God. 
praise God. I'm reminding myself of what an idiot I am. Because the truth is, if the plane fell from the sky, what can I do about it? Right? They were showing all the, the rafts and the, that the things come by. They're telling you what to do. I said to Patty, I says, you know what you need to do? What? I said, kiss yourself goodbye. You ain't surviving. And I was at perfect peace with that because Jesus has prepared a place for me. And this world is not mine. On the way home, we had a fallen soldier in the plane with us. We didn't know it. But I was wondering why it was a little bit more bumpy on the way home. The pilot was pushing it. We, had, we took off late. And we landed and we were told that there was a fallen soldier there. Wow. Don't know what happened to him or her. There was a Marine on board. How much control did they have over their life? To keep our nation free. And here I was winding over a a plane ride. Now we don't have any control. You don't have any control. You can set your plan. And you can hope all you want. But it's better just to trust in God's plan. So I want to close with this, my dear friends. How do you serve God when disappointment comes your way? And there's not one person in this room that has not been disappointed. And there's not one person in this room, I can guarantee you, that hasn't thought for a moment, you know what? What's this Christian life all about anyway? For a passing, fleeting moment, perhaps, wondering what's the purpose in all of this. But Zechariah and Elizabeth teach us, even in this, the most severe disappointments, to serve God. It's his plan we have to learn that, that disappointments, and I've said it before, and you've read it because I didn't make this up. Disappointments will either make you bitter or they will make you better. And sometimes our disappointments that come our way have a, an awful way of producing a ter terrible theology in denials of God's goodness. I hear it all the time. Oh, if God loved me, then why isn't he doing this? If God loved me, then why? If God's so good, then why? Stop asking that question. He is good. And sometimes we don't know why. We don't have all the answers. Why would God allow a godly man and a godly woman who the word of God calls blameless to actually suffer the disgrace of society? Only to accomplish his plan later. But they never gave up. Let me ask you a question. Do you count your disappointments or do you count your blessings? You better start counting your blessings. This past week, I saw a post from a friend of ours. She was the choir director in our home church. And her husband and I served on the praise team together. He was the bass player. And we had a friend of ours, and Jim also served on the praise team. Not this Jim, <laughs> but another friend of mine. He was very accomplished in guitar. He could sing. I mean, he had a great voice. If anybody have ever, have ever heard the secular group Kansas, he had a voice just like that guy. He loved the Lord, beautiful family, worked in pharmaceutical sales, top in his game. And then one day, we noticed that Jim would be maybe playing and he may be just doing his, and he, he just couldn't remember the, the words of the song. Are they all right, Jim? Yeah, I don't know what's going on. He finds out that he's got a tumor, brain tumor. So we prayed with Jim and we fasted and the Lord reduced his tumor, but not to the degree that Jim was able to continue on in his job and so his job just after all those years of service just kicked him to the curb, gave him a severance, and that was that. Talk about disappointments. A beautiful family. I don't know what happened, but as I went on to pastor, Jim, family came apart. This week I saw a post.
And there he was with our two friends. And he's in a nursing home. And it crushed me. It crushed me. And I began to ask God, why? How is it possible that a man with so much could end up, quite frankly, alone and in the place that he is in, perhaps one of the worst in the area? How is that possible, God? And in that moment, I began to count my blessings from my childhood all the way through. And while my 15-year-old grandson was enjoying roller coaster rides and everything, I sat there counting my blessings. Even in life's disappointments, I said, God, thank you for the blessing that came out of the disappointment and began to praise him. And it was as if there was a rejuvenation coming in. I can't control what happens to other people. And I don't know why. But I know this. Regardless of what. Count your blessings. Not your disappointment. And thank God even for the disappointments that come our way. Because just for a moment. Did you ever think it's part of God's plan? We would never plan disappointments in our plan, would we? We keep them out. But God puts disappointments in our plan. God puts valleys in his plan for our lives so that he can strengthen us in the valley that we can soar on eagle's, an eagle's wings. You see, being righteous and blameless does not mean a challenge-free life. It does not mean that you will not have heartaches and you can live the most godly life. And that does not mean that God will grant you every desire that you have. So I know this. If we serve God for what we can get, we're only serving ourselves. If we serve God... For what we can get, for what I can get, I'm not serving God. I'm serving myself, and you will be serving yourself. That, my dear friends, is the prosperity gospel today. That is an unbiblical gospel. That if you do this, God will most assuredly do it. Well, you tell Elizabeth and Zechariah. Hey, you look at the word of God, and here you have Elijah. 800 false gods. Bam, right? Prophets. All destroyed in a moment. And the next thing we read about him, he's hiding out in a cave because Jezebel's sending some of her army after him. Talk about a disappointment. And the angel said, stop having a pity party. Get out of your disappointment. Have something to eat and get out of that cave. God's got work for you to do. You see, the righteous person is not free from suffering because they serve the Lord. Now, we don't get everything we want because we live a life well lived. So if we're righteous people, we'll live according to God's plan, regardless of what happens in our lives. God is our hope, not just for the holidays, but for all days. It's God's plan, and we hope in him. How many guys just were the promise keepers? Promise keepers, anybody out there? Yeah, all right. Remember Joseph Garlington? It's a great hymn, too. Oh, God, our help 
in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our God while life may last and our eternal home. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our God while life may last and our eternal home. Who would have thought a plan? God would have come up with such a plan. That he would send his only begotten son into the world to die. You see, the plan of the people was that this Jesus who appeared on the scene was going to free them from Roman oppression. Here he comes. Save us, Hosanna, son of David. Save us. Oh, they're crying out, save us. All excited. But a few days into that last week, they realized he ain't going to do what we want him to do. He's not doing what we planned for him to do. And the same people that cried, save us, began to yell out, crucify him, crucify him. And so, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and the word for thanksgiving is praise. He praised God, his father, as he broke the bread. He gave it to those disciples that were there, except Judas, who was gone. He said, take this, each one of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. And after he had supped, again, he praised God. He gave the cup to his disciples. He said, take this. All of you and drink of it. This is the new covenant which is being shed in my blood for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes again. The plan of of redemption through Jesus Christ for you and for me. David, would you pray for us? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do come before you with humble hearts. As that beautiful hymn we sang this morning, we left the glories of heaven to come down to be nailed on that rugged cross for us. Even though we don't sacrifice your son for us that after his death he rose and we look forward to his coming again and taking us home. Bless us through our body.
Father, we thank you that through your son, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for the forgiveness of sin, the shed blood, you have delivered us from the domain of darkness into light and life everlasting and eternal. And we eat this bread together, your church, with thanksgiving in our hearts. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. But the Lamb of God has done away with the sacrifices of bulls and goats. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John the Baptist declared. And so what can wash away my sin, our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Your church drinks this cup to remember you, Lord Jesus, in your sacrifice and your shed blood, the spotless Lamb of God, for the forgiveness of our sins. He's about to go to the cross, and yet he took time to lead his disciples in a song. Let's stand and sing as his disciples to him this beautiful song. This is my father's world. <laughs>
shortest but most profound and challenging prayer we could ever pray is the one that the Lord prayed in Gethsemane. Thy will, not my will, be done. God bless you as he accomplishes his plan in our lives.